about the Word of God and that it's going to go into your heart and into good soil and it's going to build faith in you and you're not going to be the same when you leave this auditorium tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, you have caused your Word to become so alive in my heart and in the hearts of these who are here that we come tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in his strength, in his power, in his love, and in his vigor. I thank you that your word is forever settled in heaven and that there will not be a one who will leave here tonight without being thrilled that you are an unlimited God and that we can connect with your power and work for wholeness in our bodies and in our families' lives. In Jesus' name, we agree and say that it is done. And we say, say it again. Now, repeat this after me. God is a good God. God is a healing God. God is a wonderful God. God loves me. Turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you. Oh, it's good to hear that. In John, the first, in John, the book of John, the first chapter, verses 32 and 33, we're going to use several scriptures because I'm going to be talking tonight about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Holy Spirit and the importance the anointing plays in your own wholeness. John gave further evidence saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and it dwelt on him not to depart. And I did not know him nor recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in with water said to me, Upon whom you shall see the Spirit descend and remain, that one is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit of God filling the Lord Jesus. And it was the anointing, it was that presence of the Spirit that caused Jesus to come into the ministry that was promised belonging to him. He was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. We hear of no miracles in the life of Jesus. He did no miracles until he went to the River Jordan and the Spirit of God came upon him and the anointing of the Holy Spirit began to flow through him. And the first thing that the Bible tells us is What he did after that, he was led in the wilderness by the Holy Spirit in Luke. And as he was led there, he overcame the temptation of the evil one. And we know that there are things that we have to overcome. But he had the Holy Spirit within him, the power of the Spirit, to overcome and override the opportunities that he had to be tested. And when he had finished that, Luke 4.18 says that he came back from the wilderness and he began to teach and to preach and to minister to the sick. And the 18th verse says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus was reading this. And he said, Because he has what? Anointed me. Say that with me. Anointed me. The anointed one, meaning the Messiah, to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth delivered those who are oppressed, who are downtrodden, bruised, crushed down by calamity. Now the word anointed here comes from a Greek word meaning to contact or to smear, coming from another Greek word which means to furnish what is needed to light upon to employ or act towards in a given manner. Now, let me read that again. I want you to begin to grasp a little more of the anointing. It means to furnish what is needed. You should make a note of that. One of the first things it means is to furnish what is needed. The anointing of the Holy Spirit will furnish what is needed. So he's going to do that. To light upon, to employ or act towards towards in a given manner. He's going to act toward you in a given manner. How? In a good given manner. What is that given manner? The manner of your need. The, the area of your need is going to reach out and the Spirit of God is endeavoring right now through the anointing and is working as you're sitting, as you're listening on tape. The Spirit of God is moving in that anointing. Whether you comprehend it or not is really 
immaterial. It is an occurrence that happens. Now listen to what Romans 8.11 says. Let's go on further with our study on the anointing. You see, it's the anointing of the Spirit. He's the one who is furnishing what we need. After Jesus finished his earthly ministry, he was crucified, he was buried, he was raised from the dead, and listen to what Romans 8.11 says, and this gets very interesting. And if the Spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also restore to life your mortal, short-lived, perishable bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Say that, through his Spirit who dwells in you. Through his Spirit who dwells in you. So we see that it's the Spirit that raised him from the dead. The Spirit works is in the anointing. The anointing is of the Spirit. And now we come into the subject of special anointings. And in 1 Corinthians 12, if you'll look this scripture up, if you haven't a Bible, write it down and look it up. The first verse reads, Now about the spiritual gifts, the special endowments of supernatural energy, brethren, I do not want you misinformed. The Amplified says in brackets, which brings the fullness of meaning to the word, the special endowments of supernatural energy. So, I don't want you ignorant about the special endowments of supernatural energy. I want you to know about them. I want you to know about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In verse 4, there are distinctive varieties and distributions of endowments, and they vary, but the Spirit remains the same. In other words, every gift does not operate in the same way. The gifts are listed in order, but I want to call your attention to the gifts, to talk about the gifts that are the power gifts. The gift of faith, the gift of healing, and the working of miracles. Let's turn our attention to faith, to the gift of healing, and to the working of miracles. You see, on occasion, when believers are being ministered to in a service, the gift of faith is in operation, and it causes unbelievers to have their healings manifest because there's a collective faith of an audience. There is collective faith here. One, I know it because it's taught. Number two, I know it because I sense it. Number three, I know it because I've seen it demonstrated. Number four, I know it because there has been prayer in faith for miracles. So there is a collective faith that is a blessing to every person in the community or anyone who would dare to come in here even if they are an unbeliever because the collective faith is in operation. The gift of faith, there's the gift that operates through the individual believing. I know there are times when that gift will operate through me. I wish that it operated all the time, but it is as the Spirit wills. All the gifts are. Now there is faith. Every person has the measure of faith. We know that. You cannot be born again, and we can increase our faith. But the gift of faith drops on you in a moment. Have you ever had that experience when suddenly it seemed that you kicked into another gear, you went into another dimension, and you could believe beyond belief? For instance, a year ago when I was speaking here, a woman came forward with a problem with her mouth, her gums, and her chin, and it was one of those very special services. They're all special, but some services have greater anointing than others. You say, why is it that way? I don't really know. I just know I don't miss any of them. This woman had a problem with her jaws, and, and many who are here witnessed it. The gift of faith dropped in my heart on behalf of that woman. Everything said in the natural, she shouldn't be healed. She was going in to have surgery. She had, uh, as I remember, the gums. Uh, the, the, we couldn't even touch her face. Her face was so sore, I couldn't even put my hands on her face. After 45 minutes, we could lay hands on her face. The numb area over her lip was restored. The face began to straighten up. We watched it. It took 45 minutes. But the gift of faith, it was the gift of the Holy Spirit that dropped into my heart 
that allowed me to believe that. There are other nights she might have come forward. I might not have operated in that gift. You say, well, why does God do that? I don't know if it's all God or part me or part God or part me. I don't know how to divide that. I don't divide that. All I know is it is as the Spirit wills when it operates through me to my understanding at this moment. I'm open to further revelation, and I'm sure I will receive it before I die or after I die, but I will get that revelation. But the, that gift of faith that will fall on you, you who are studying to go into the ministry and you who are here, you, how many of you have ever laid hands on the sick? How many have ever prayed for the sick? All of you. Almost. And the rest of you are good candidates to do the same thing because believers lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It doesn't have to be a special calling to pray for people. But the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit operates through these power gifts especially. It operates in all the gifts. But when we have the gift of faith, then it operates very well and very strong in the gift of healing. As the gift of healing or the gifts, people argue over what's correct, and it really is immaterial to me if you want to call it the gift or the gifts. I see a lot of things happen, so I like the plural if you like the singular. I'm sure heaven won't be shaken over an interpretation. Will it? The kingdom of God will not rise and fall over a comma being misplaced in the Bible. Well, that takes a lot of pressure off of us, doesn't it? We don't have to be legal about the way we word everything. I like to be careful, but I, it really, you know, as long as our heart is right and our intent is right, we want to get the right word out. So that faith begins to incorporate itself with the gifts. Off times Now, tonight I had, as I was singing, I sang the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. The word of knowledge is a past tense experience. The word of wisdom is the present or future tense. Those gifts come in. They couple together. There are various combinations. Some people operate in one, some in another, some in all the gifts, some on occasion in one gift, some on occasion the other gift. It is as the Spirit wills, but we are all available to be used as the Spirit wills. Then the creative miracle. A miracle is something, as I understand it at this point, like turning water into wine. Now, that's not a healing. That's a miracle. But a miracle in the physical realm and the body would be a finger growing out. Now, I had a woman in a service one time who came with her finger cut off, the index finger, right to the first uh, joint. And when she came forward, she said, I want my finger healed. Well, you can't heal what isn't there. Can you? And so I said, we just command that finger to grow out in Jesus' name. I'll be very honest, quite honest. I didn't expect it to grow out. I did it in obedience, but there was so much faith, the gifts were in operation, and the finger grew right out. I was the most surprised person there. <laughs> I was in shock. It was especially delightful because my banker was there, and he didn't believe in any of this. Signs and wonders are for unbelievers also, you know. They're, they're the evidence to the community. And so what we had happen and what we experienced was a, a supernatural miracle. Now, I've had that in other instances where things have legs of lengthened. That's creative. Portions of the body have been recreated. That's all the miracle working power of God. But the thing that is so important is as the holy the anointing of the holy spirit is present things begin to happen people begin to get healed miracles begin to happen first corinthians 12 28 tells us of the office to which god calls men and women verse 28 of first corinthians 12 listen so god has appointed some in the church for his own use first apostles special messengers second prophets inspired preachers and expounders third teachers then wonder workers, then those with the ability to heal the sick, helpers, administrators, speakers in unknown tongues. Then verse 30, look at this, underline this, verse 30. Do all possess the extraordinary powers of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? So you will see that there are those with ability, ability to operate with the gifts of healing and miracles. Verse 30 asks the question, do all have the gifts of healings? Obviously, they do not. If they did, we'd all be out in healing ministries, and I could retire. You think I'm kidding. I'd love to retire. 
I am not driven. I'm led. It was a profound statement if you'll just think about it. Do all possess the gifts of healing? Well, we have to look at that and say, obviously not. Earlier it found that the Bible says it's as the Spirit wills that the gifts are given. Now these gifts are in operation to the glory of God, not to the glory of a person. They should always point to God, never to the individual. We get in trouble when we let the gifts point to us. We always direct the glory and the praise to the one who's doing it, to the glory of God. Something happened to the early church that's most interesting. I want you to look in Acts, the fourth chapter. I want you to look this scripture up. We're still talking about the anointing of the Spirit. Acts 4, 27 through 31 says, I would like you to notice in verse 27, mentions the name of Jesus, and they said, Whom you consecrated by anointing. Now, there is a word in a name that is above all names, and when we use that name, there is great power. What is it? Okay, the early church came together, and this was their prayer. Whom you consecrated. They mentioned Jesus. Whom you consecrated by what? Anointing. How, did they, how was Jesus consecrated? By anointing. He was consecrated by anointing. Now, just, just let that roll around on the inside of you for a while. Think about that. Jesus was consecrated by anointing. Let me read this to you in Acts. You see, the prayer is very important that we come together and collectively pray. Something happens. Verse 30, While you stretched out your hand to cure and perform signs and wonders through the authority and by the power of the name of your holy child Jesus and servant Jesus, and listen, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were assembled was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they continued to speak the word of God with freedom and boldness and courage. God consecrated Jesus by the anointing. Let's look at the, the, the ministry of Jesus over in Luke, the fifth chapter, to, to a special occurrence in the ministry of Jesus. In Luke, the fifth chapter. I'm more convinced as time goes by that the greatest study that we can do is to study everything that Jesus said, every deed that he did, to know him. The more I know him, the more I become like him. The more I become like him, the more I'm fulfilling the destiny that I have on the earth. The destiny that I have is not to be great. The destiny I have is to be like Jesus. See, that is our destiny. The potential is within every individual. The potential is within every individual, but it's choices that are made. We decide how much we will allow him to come forth, and it's a process, and don't be discouraged if you haven't made it. I haven't either, but I'm working, and you are also. Now, the fifth chapter, look at Jesus. Let's see what he did here. In Luke, the fifth chapter, verse 17 says, One of those days, as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come from every village and town of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him present to heal them. The power was there. It was with Jesus. And it was present to heal everyone who was there. Then we'll read on. And behold, some men were bringing on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. And they tried to carry him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him with his stretcher down through the tiles into the midst in the front of Jesus. And when he saw their confidence in him springing from their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. Then go down to verse 24. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the power of authority and the right on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, arise, pick up your litter, and go to your own house. And instantly the man stood up before them, 
picked up what he had been lying on and went away to his house recognizing and praising and thanking God. The power of God was present with him to heal them, but we only have record of one man being healed in the whole place. Jesus was anointed. The anointing was there. I learned a secret. You like secrets. I love secrets. I like surprises better that are good. But I enjoy knowing something that's going to help me that someone's learned. That's what Paul was saying when he said, I've learned the secret. I've learned how to be content. And you're really there's a secret brotherhood that he understood. I, there's a secret. Well, I've learned a secret these last number of months. In November, quite by surprise, I was stricken with an illness that I had not anticipated. I had no idea that I was going to have a problem. Have you ever had a surprise like that? And... I began going downhill rapidly. I will share with you tomorrow night in depth the steps of healing that I have experienced. It has been extraordinary. But I will tell you slightly so that you can have a foundation so that you can come find out what I've done because I have learned many, many, many things about healing. The end result of the illness that was finally detected and discovered through, thank God for the word of God and the word of knowledge operating in doctors. That's when people get silent when I say that. Do you know there are doctors who are led of the Holy Spirit? I live with one. How extraordinary God would have me marry a man whose specialty is the brain chemistry he would just be recertified, go and learn everything that he could that's current, and that he would be the one to detect. Can you see the foreknowledge of God he planned years ago for my life to be saved? And he knew how to bring me to Tulsa, bring this man from another part of the world, that he might save my life. But you see, that wasn't all. There's many things. Word of knowledge. Medication. I believe in taking medicine. If someone says take medicine, the medicine isn't the miracle worker. My husband, any doctor will tell you the medicine helps you, but it doesn't heal you. But I was doing everything that I could do, and I was getting no better, only worse. We were praying, we were believing, thanking God the medicine would in time work. One doctor said in six months, perhaps. Now, this is in December. In six months, I might begin to pull out. I needed to exercise, but because of another condition that was a revelation of the Holy Spirit to another doctor at the City of Faith, interestingly enough, I couldn't exercise because of the condition. It would only make the condition worse, but I needed to exercise to make it better. The end result of my illness, had it not been detected, I would have wound up, listen, Plesley, this is a true story, it would have been in a nursing home or a mental institution because of imbalance in the chemicals that wouldn't have been detected. Only by living with my husband, who is a specialist in the brain, could it have been detected. Isn't God clever? I mean, isn't he smart? I won't share all the steps tonight to healing that I have learned because I want to talk about the anointing. In January, I was committed to go to California to speak. Rex Bonnenberg, who's worked with me for how many years, Rex? Hundred? Ten. I was on the West Coast, but he's begun helping me more. In fact, in that illness, he came in and he and my husband and my staff all worked together trying to figure out how to get all the ends to work out because the illness was of such magnitude. We were having some great challenges. When Rex first saw me when he came to Tulsa, I could barely walk. I would hit the wall to the left. I'd hold onto the wall all the way down the hall. 
I could understand things, but I had a very hard time trying to speak or to communicate. Be very gracious to people who seem mentally deficient. They probably are much more alert than they're able to let you know. I was very alert, but I couldn't let I was imprisoned within myself. Be gracious to those with strokes who can't talk. They can comprehend. They're human beings. Be kind to the handicapped. They may not stay handicapped forever if we get busy with the anointing. But be gracious to them. They're human beings with feelings and understanding. You see, I experienced people who loved me, but they... I kept doing everything I needed to do. I got out of bed every morning, did my makeup, did my hair. I never believed I was going to stay sick. I acted well, even when I held onto walls and fell. I went out to dinners with friends, and after a while, when I couldn't keep up my end of the conversation, out of graciousness and embarrassment, they'd begin to converse with one another, leaving me out because I couldn't keep up. I knew what was going on, but I was imprisoned. There was, I was imprisoned in me, and I couldn't say anything that made too much sense. And so when Rex saw me, I was barely able to walk. But I was committed, and I've learned faith takes action. You know, it's easy to say, oh, brother, oh, friend, oh, sister, believe God. But you see, I had years of putting the word inside me, and I built faith within me. And even when I was weak and couldn't pray for myself, still that faith was flickering. It was there. Faith is vibrant and vital and alive and powerful and active and energizing. And I was committed to go minister, and we believed I would make it. And within a week after Rex got there, he saw me begin to walk much better. But you see, because I hadn't been able to walk, my muscles had begun to deteriorate, and so I was weak. He went on to California, and I had to go. I had to change planes twice, three planes, to get to my speaking engagement. Now, just I've been an invalid. Now, look at this. I've been semi-invalid. I never stayed in bed, but in the natural, I, I, well, it didn't, you wouldn't think I could get from one plane to the next, okay? You understand my thinking sometime would I'd get confused. But I got on a plane at 7 o'clock on a Friday morning and left Tulsa, Oklahoma, believing God that I would have a healing service in California that night. I went to Dallas, could barely walk off the plane. My friend Sharon met me. She had a cart that carried me to my next plane. We got to California, and they had a wheelchair. Oh, how humiliating. The healing evangelist, Super healer getting out into a wheelchair to go through the international airport in Los Angeles, California. But I had to. They wheeled me through the airport. Three women saw me and said, Are you Vicki Jameson? I said, Yes. And they just, it just, they were crushed. How could their hero, how could this healing evangelist be in a wheelchair? And I didn't have the heart to tell them I'm on my way to do a healing service tonight. You see, faith without works is dead. You have to put your actions where your mouth has been. And so I arrived that afternoon, went out to eat, went back to the room, and I was so weak I couldn't stand at the mirror to do my hair. I, I didn't have a chair. I put a luggage rack. I sat on a luggage rack, and I did my hair, and I dressed. I got to the service. There was, I tell you what, I didn't even, I hardly knew my name, but Rex and Sharon believed, and the people there believed. They got me up to the front. It was my whole service. There was no one to lead singing. I had to lead singing. And I couldn't remember any song except Blessed Assurance. So we started singing, Blessed. You have to use what you have. Use what you have. And I sang Blessed Assurance. Jesus is my. Then I, I think this was Hallelujah, wasn't it, Rex? And he lived. I remembered he lived. And I, I remembered three or four songs, and, and I would just, it was hurtful, it was painful, it would have been more comfortable to stay home in bed, it would have been more comfortable to quit the ministry. I can quit the ministry if I want to. But I'm led, not driven. I'm led by the Holy Spirit. 
I've been saying all these years, faith works. Now, if I don't demonstrate it, it won't change faith, but I'll lose what I've been saying is possible. And so I began calling out healing. Uh, people were healed everywhere, you know, and I was just kind of a space cadet. Your leg is healed, your arm is healed, and no one knew how, you know, I was just out to lunch, basically. But listen to what I, I discovered. The anointing of the Holy Spirit began to give me strength, and I began to stand. I could barely walk across the platform that evening. But by the end of the evening, I said to the audience, look at how well I'm walking. And what we all love is an instant miracle. We want it to be instant and forever, and we don't want anything to go beyond that. Now, you'd love me saying that was it. No, I have literally possessed the healing moment by moment ever since, but it gets better. The next night, I did another healing service. Sunday morning, I had to get up early, go to another city, do a service, and I walked in the church, and I was so ill that I felt like I was dying. I thought I was dying. I thought, I'm dying. I am dying. But faith never stops, and I went up to the podium because I'm a minister of the gospel. I didn't come to die. I came to deliver the word of God. People were healed that morning. Oh, I never saw more healings than on that trip. Month, Sunday night I did a service. Monday night I did a service. Tuesday on the way to Los Angeles, I was driving and a virus hit me. I became violently ill with that flu that was going around. Everyone, you know, was staying in bed a week. We stopped and went to a motel, and the next morning I got up totally well of that virus. It didn't attach itself to me. I did a 10 o'clock healing service. That's where we saw, would you say 70% of our audience was healed that morning? It was a large audience. We're talking big. Then I began to get more strength. And what I discovered was every time, now listen closely, every time that I sat or stood in my own service where the anointing of God was present, I became stronger. Now, there were many things involved. I had to get there. I had to get my body there. My body did not want to go. My body wanted to be in bed and had good reason. It wanted to be, you know, saying, I, I don't believe I'm going with you. And my spirit was not abusing my body. I don't believe in battering our bodies. We must care for our bodies. But there is the time we must say, body, you are under. The spirit and the word are over. The word of God says, with his stripes I'm healed, and I'm going to be healed. But saying that alone is powerful, but the coupling up with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, where the gifts are in operation, takes you into a dimension of wholeness, takes you into a dimension of of completion, and all times you're sitting under the anointing and you may not see one great spectacular occurrence. You may not see the great thing, but the Spirit of God is just moving, moving, moving. It's like sandpaper, sanding rough edges, sanding away, working away on you. The Spirit of God, when you're sitting under the anointing, is doing things that you never understand. Only on occasion do you have an experience dramatic enough that you can point to it and say, that happened under the anointing. But if you could be spiritually developed and aware, you would begin to see something happen to you now as you're listening, now as you're experiencing the presence. And every moment, oh, I tell you, I do not comprehend individuals who need to be healed who only give God one shot, who will come to a service once and be healed or not be healed and not come again. I don't comprehend someone being healed and not coming back the next night just to give glory. I don't understand someone coming and not being healed tonight but saying, well, I'm staying away tomorrow night. It didn't work for me. God's power is present. Be there. That's one of the most important things I've learned through this is be with the anointing. Be under the anointing. Be around the anointing. It's a tragedy to see a front row empty. Do you know how I got the anointing for my ministry? Do you want to hear another secret? Would you like it? I was so hungry for God. I didn't want a ministry. Didn't ask for a ministry. I was wanting God. And I sat on the front row of the ministry of a man named Kenneth Hagin. Because I just love to feel the power go up and down my body. I didn't tell anyone there, oh, I feel the power. No, I didn't say it. I just sat there and absorbed it. Now, knowing that anointing was going to flow into me to lead me into a ministry of healing. 
You see, I, I would be on the front row every night. I don't like back row seats. I'll be real honest. Could we just take the back row out? You say, but the anointing's everywhere. You know, yes, it is. Yes, that's true. But there's something about being close to the anointing. When there's anointed ministry around, don't bug them, but hang around. The door opens, get there. If Jesus were announced to personally be present, everyone would be on the front row, except those who feel guilty. Everyone might be on the back row. No, we wouldn't feel guilty. We would feel forgiven. We'd want to be close to Jesus. I just told you how God anoints men and women, special anointing. Specially anointed with gifts, and you should be right there, close to that gift. Not worshiping the individual, but absorbing. Absorbing. Oh, that we could see in the Spirit. That we could see the tangible anointing of the Holy Spirit. It is as tangible as this podium. Right here. Now, let me tell you what happened. I came back off the trip, was strong for two or three days because of that power of anointing, and then I started downhill again, just as rapidly as I come uphill. But every day I got up, I got dressed, I acted healed. Didn't feel like it, didn't want to. It hurt me to take steps. I could have cried when I walked many times. I wanted to cry from the pain. But faith doesn't quit. Faith doesn't quit. Now hear what I'm telling you. Some of you have been standing and you think, oh, well, I didn't get it. You possess it. You possess anything in the spiritual world. You possess it. God gave it. You possess it. But if he wanted me to have it, I'd have it. Do you think God wanted me to be sick? No. He didn't want me to be sick. Why did I get sick? Basically because I didn't use good principles in my life of health. I've stressed myself out through too much strain, through too many years and too many claims. I stripped my body. I'm learning how to replace it, though. I'd go out and I'd minister again. The strength of the Spirit would be there, and then I'd hit walls. I went up and down. I did that several weeks. In the end of January, there was a seminar at Rhema, Kenneth Hagin's Bible School. I didn't make it to any of the services. I was going Monday night. Something came up. Tuesday night, guests came from out of town. Every night, something interfered. Thursday, the Spirit of the Lord literally exploded on the inside of me saying, you must go tonight. When my husband came home from the hospital, I said, Carl, we must go to, I'm going to Rhema tonight. He said, I'd like to go too. I said, good. On the way out there, I'd, I, I'd gotten to the point, people get tired of hearing you complain. Don't tell them how bad you feel, you know. They get weary of it. Isn't that right? Oh, you haven't learned that. It gets very tiresome to them. No one had said anything to me, but I mean, why play a record a hundred times? You know, that's negative. But I hurt. Every part of my body hurt when I went to that ministry. I didn't want to go. My mind didn't feel sharp. I didn't feel clear. He let me out at the door. My husband's a gracious gentleman. He went to park the car, and I, I wandered in the building, and some friends came up, and I got a seat, and and uh, I, I, I was, the Lord was good to me. I got a seat up front, real close, you know, the kind of light. And I was so absorbed in the praise and the worship. It was the night of glory. I'm, I'm sure I was there the best night of all the nights in the whole meeting. Brother Hagin began to minister in the Spirit. He called me down. He said, come down here. And of course, the Holy Spirit knows I've given great, great consideration to retiring and and quitting and slowing down. And he said, you can't quit. Now, I hadn't told him that. That was the, you can't quit. And then he began to minister about some experiences I'd had with people and then how the, the Spirit was getting me ready for the greater ministry, for the greater anointing that many would be blessed. Now, what was real interesting was I walked out of that building so energized, so full of strength. Of course, the word of the Lord never offends you. When you hear that kind of a word, that makes you excited. But I realized when I left, 
I was so full of energy, I was walking straight, I was thinking clearly, and I realized that from the moment, listen to this, so I stepped in that auditorium, I was perfectly clear. All the symptoms lifted. I was under the anointing. I was under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now by the afternoon of the next day, the symptoms tried to come back again. See, Satan would love for me to take it back and say, Aha! I've learned a lot of secrets. I've learned you can overcome him not only by the word, but there are a lot of things you can do to overcome the devil. None of it's easy. If you want to be lazy and take it easy, you can die. And still go to heaven. I don't plan to die. I don't plan to wind up in a nursing home. And I'll be real honest. Would you like to hear something else? My mind is becoming sharper and clearer, and I'm more articulate than I've ever been in my life. The Lord is showing me in things that I'm studying and learning. It is, it is mind-boggling to me, the knowledge of the Spirit of God that He's given to me. It is surpassing anything I've ever comprehended or understood. For the Lord God is a great God, and he will yet reveal unto his people the deepest and the most intimate secrets of knowledge that have been kept since the beginning of time. For you've come to an hour of the revealing of the Christ. You've come to a time when the mysteries are going to be made known. Because Christ is a mystery. And his church is a mystery. But the world is going to see the veil taken back. And the heart of the Father is going to be revealed. And the heart of the Father is wholeness, body, soul, and spirit. And great knowledge is going to be imparted unto his children. And the world is going to look and say, where have they received this? Where did they get this authority? And where did they get this hidden knowledge? But it shall be an amazing fact that shall break upon the mind. Know you not that even before the fall, Adam was endued with great knowledge? Did he not have dominion over all things? Did he not name all of creation? Did he not have control of all of the things living? You will see a full restoration in the church of the knowledge of the children of the living God. For the Holy Ghost is creation. And your mind shall become what God wants it to become. And the knowledge of the Lord shall fill the earth. And you are the church to be filled with that knowledge. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just stand and praise the Lord. Just stand for a moment. Stand right now, just quickly. No one leaving. Just stand and begin to praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you. Yes, praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. No one leaving except in emergency. We're not finished. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the anointing of healing. We thank you that we can sit at your feet. We thank you that we are endued with power. We're endued with power. Glory to God. Yes, do you know there are hidden mysteries? We've talked about it for years, but we're we're at the time of the uncovering of the hidden mysteries in every area. 
spiritually, scientifically, medically. There, there is not anything hidden, Jesus said, but that is to be revealed. Jesus said that. And there are some things that we need to really be keyed on in prayer and keen on in prayer, and that is Ephesians, the first chapter, the 17th verse, and that's 17 on through 22. For revelation knowledge, pray it for you, for your household, for those around you, for people who are in positions of authority, because revelation knowledge is flowing, discoveries are being made spiritually, we're learning principles that are working. There are things that we know that we've learned that we can't yet tell because people can't comprehend some of them. They're not really ready for them. See, and if you'd, if you'd share some of them, they, they'd say, oh, they're so crazy, they're off. They're off in the left field. So what you have to do is keep giving milk. But there, there is more. Not to try to seem super mysterious, but, but there is knowledge that is available that will help us in the areas of healing that are, that are just simply... Superb that I know I will be operating in within the next two years. See? But I have another year, Lord told me, of studying. I have a learn year of studying. My next year is to study. I'm, I'll be ministering, but I'll be studying. But watch out after a year. Because you see, the greater miracles will then begin to release. So I'll see miracles until then. But after that, the greater works are going to begin to unfold very miraculously. Now, there's a timing for everything, but God wants us to come into his perfect will. And right now, I'm going to ask you, if you desire more knowledge of the anointing and the gifts of the Spirit, more of, you want to know more from the Lord, that you'd like him to reveal the word to you, just raise your hand and let's pray for that. All right, would you like it? Keep your hand up and let's pray about it. Now, Father, you said ask and we should receive. And in the name of Jesus, our hands are raised and our hearts are open. And we're saying afresh and anew tonight, my Lord, we come before you as your sons and your daughters, available, open to study, to learn, to grow. You may speak to us in any way you choose. We are open to any and everything, and you said that a thing is not hidden, but that it might be revealed. So reveal the hidden things. Father, reveal the hidden things that we need to know in life, in our businesses, that will bring out fruit. The hidden things that we need to know to help us to come into the nature of Christ in our own lives. Reveal those hidden things that we might come into fullness and knowledge and strength, the power of the gifts of the Spirit, that we would flow within the gifts that the Spirit would use us in, and that we would be available and that wisdom would watch over us. Wisdom would guard us. In Jesus' name, we say amen. Can you say amen? How many are going to act on the Word of God? Did you learn something tonight? You may be seated a moment. Isn't it exciting to be in his presence? Would you please not leave? Would you please be kind enough to not leave? We want to take a love offering tonight for Vicki James.